are certainly grateful for uh, Dr. Edmondson um, stepping in. And yeah, amen. Come on. And uh, I know that we're supposed to keep stuff in our pockets, but that pocket was loaded. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was just one pocket. <laughs> but let me tell you how the Lord works. You already know, but, you know, we, we had to make some adjustments with um, the panel due to our sister um, needing some, some time at home, Sister Trillia. Please keep praying uh, for her. And, and so when making contact with Sister Dr. Edmondson um, and, and choosing this topic, um, and then we come to uh, this panel discussion, the Bible, complementarians and egalitarians in dialogue, how much agreement. I mean, you couldn't have planned, we couldn't have planned that better, T, right? And so what I did, I'm listening to Dr. Edmondson. I'm changing all of my notes, all my questions I'm going to have <laughs> for this panel. Um, we titled it The Bible complementarians and egalitarians in dialogue, how much agreement. Now, we did that on purpose with, with placing the Bible out there. Um, first, because, because we're Christians, and, and the Bible is our textbook, even though it's, it's often misused and abused, but it is our textbook. And so the Bible is where uh, this conversation begins, and, and it could be uh, where this conversation ends. If, if the inspiration, the clarity, the sufficiency, the necessity of scripture, if that's tossed out, then we can't be in much of a conversation about a subject like this. I tried that in the barber shop one day. It doesn't really work. We can't have real meaningful conversations like uh, Garrett said yesterday with our Bibles closed. And, and Dr. Edmondson uh, encouraged us in that and so y'all need to go out, going out there and go ahead and just get your logos right now and, and get your Bibles open. Complementarianism, egalitarianism, it, it's a poll. It's a poll. What I want to do um, is begin our, our conversation here with uh, some of the things that, that's made it uh, so polarized. Um, I'll start with, what, with one of the things I think. Dr. Edmondson mentioned this uh, in, her, in her talk. I think one of the, and, and, and I'm a complementarian, and, and I've had to discover this um, in my own thinking. Uh, when I was introduced to complementarianism uh, 20 years or so ago, I think what, I've, what I have discovered is that sometimes cultural opinions uh, are, are, are mixed with proof texts that a careful eye will discover that the real end goal is to simply safeguard the power of men while at the same time marginalizing women. And I had to come to that understanding that that's one of the, that's one of the things in the middle that, that pushes uh, complementarians and, and egalitarians in separate or opposite poles. That's my, that's, that's one of the things, it, well you guys. What are some of the, some of the areas that, that's causing this polarization in this conversation? I would just say that there's a, a lack of permission to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. Is you, uh, I, I love Dr. Christina and, and she's incredibly brilliant. She, she calls them poles, I, I like to call them boxes. Is, is we all like to have our cute pristine boxes and, and so that I can put you in that box so that you can fit what I think of you and I can subscribe, subscribe to you all of the things that I put on that box. But what do you do with somebody who doesn't fit in your box, who explodes your box? And when you have a conversation where poles are so far away, these poles are so far away, um, you, you wonder is, is there a middle ground anywhere, or do I have to be all the way this way or all the way that way? And without that permission, then there is a, there's a, I think there's a confusion and a struggle mm -hmm. that pushes the poles 
even further apart, if that makes sense. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll just got to come up with a different name for you. <laughs> you know, we, we need another box we with another, another box. name <laughs> in order for it to make sense right, in our mind. Right, right, yeah. right. Such a, such a polite panel. <laughs> it's going to be so nice. <laughs> it's similar to our politics, right? You know, it's, it's like if you believe in this issue, then therefore you are immediately tied to all these other issues. And then, you know, you're not allowed to have different convictions. But really, I mean, if you look at egalitarianism or complementarianism, like even within those camps, there's tremendous diversity sure in convictions all along the way. And there's also problematic ways that people approach scripture. And, you know, is, it has to do with the way that they're tied to their Trinitarian theology. You know, what do you believe in somebody's writing about the eternal subordination of the Son to the Father? And other people are saying, no, it's not. It's mutual submission. And you read scripture, you're like, really? I don't know. Yeah, I would think that one of the things that makes the conversation difficult is that... Um, we are always in the arena of spiritual warfare. Uh, I think the very first words of Satan is whispering through the serpent in Genesis 3 is that, did God really say? And he has schemes and strategies and he wants to divide and conquer. And so when you're seeing pressure to push people apart in the, in the, in the body of Christ, you're seeing and experiencing spiritual warfare. And Christians ought never think that we enter conversations with our Bibles where we're not fighting in spiritual warfare. So Paul is, I mean, his climatic conclusion in Ephesians 6 is that um, finally, and he, he's been driving to this literary point that we've got to put on the full armor of God because we're fighting spiritual warfare. So I think the way we fight spiritual warfare is prayerfully with our Bibles open, driven by love, but also with a deep conviction that there is truth and that the perspicuity of scripture makes us, I think, all the more responsible to work hard to find it. So uh, I think they're legitimate hermeneutical issues. They're legitimate interpretive issues. It's a complicated issue. So I think we just got to sit at the table and really push each other, knowing that the Holy Spirit will illumine us and our enemy wants to confuse us. So spiritual warfare, I mean, it's a, it's a conversation that um, with, our, with our Bibles open, we know that there, there are other forces going on. Right? And I think you're right, Bobby, that sometimes we forget that. We think we're probably just having an intellectual conversation. Mm -hmm. We have some differences in, in um, opinions about the roles of men and women. And you're saying that what, what we're having, in fact, uh, we're, we're having um, this conversation, but there are forces, evil forces, that are, that's really wants to dictate the conversation. And, and that, in t that evil force, the evil force, the enemy, can cause or make it seem like we're polarized when in fact we're not. And then like, like Judy said, and then even within the camps, you know, there's differences, of, differences in, in how people view even their own complementarianism or their own egalitarianism. But if we forget that this is a, this is a spiritual battle, um, maybe we might, we might be inventing <laughs> Uh, polarized opinions and, and stances. It could be invent we could be used like that. So then, uh, what, you what, I'm sorry, you, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no I was going to cut you off. Go <laughs> ahead, oh, yeah, that's all right. I, I, but no, you're so polite, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, right? I, 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 I would say even now, we ought to be praying, because this is spiritual warfare even now, okay. that uh, Satan moves in Christian spaces, and so he wants to attack us, and so we need to be praying now. Yeah, amen, amen. So then, um, knowing that, brothers and sisters, knowing that, um, where, where do we agree? Where do complementarians and egalitarians, is there any agreement? Yeah, I, I, I would think so. I think we have to ask some fundamental questions. Um, the first question I would think we'd have to ask if we would agree, is Paul wrong? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, is he simply wrong when he says that he doesn't permit a, you know, a, a woman to teach a man and exercise authority over a man? So we have that question answered. If we agreed to that, then we're agreeing, I think, fundamentally in, with Genesis chapter 1 that we equally share in the dignity and honor as image bearers that when God made us, the first fundamental principle of thinking through what it means to be human, male or female, are humans, that 
we equally bear the image and dignity and honor uh, of, of being representatives of God. He jumped right into First Timothy. He, he jumped. Too. He went straight he went to. Right, I mean, right. just wasn't playing around. We could have started in Genesis one twenty seven. Bobby, and and, then, and, you, and and notice notice how he framed the question. Yes. Well, is he wrong? Is he wrong? <laughs> is it? You is read it? the text. He's, he's Bobby's a polite gentleman, but he ain't what, no not, joke. Well, not polite about what Bobby just he did just no now. Joke. He ain't no joke. Let's get it on. <laughs> Okay, so I want to answer the question more directly because, like, I think it's, it's really important for us to just say that every person, regardless of whether they're identifying as an egalitarian or a complementarian, complementarian, I almost said ist, um, it, they, they are approaching the text trying to do the best they can to interpret it as faithfully as possible, right? And so I think what happens in a lot of the debates, it's like, you're just being unscholarly, or you're twisting scripture, or you're, you know, and all of those sort of accusations, I feel like, are unhelpful um, when they, dis, you know, cast dispersions on people's motivations. It's different from pointing out biases. It actually is like trying to say there's something inferior about the way that you think and approach the text. So we need to repent first about those attitudes um, and just say, look, we both are conservative Christians trying to approach the text with as great a level of fidelity as possible. Amen. So, um, but I, I do think that even the, the mindset of, is Paul wrong, that, that is a particular framework. And I think if you want to deconstruct that, you need to say, well, but you have to remember that Paul is writing to Timothy, who's living in Ephesus, and there's an entire context, you know, it's the temple of... Artemis is in Ephesus, and the priests there are women. It is a worship of a goddess, and there are all kinds of things going on there that are very specific to this context. He's writing this to Timothy in Ephesus. So when you look at this, you, you know, we can't forget that. Absolutely. Um, so, so first to answer your, yes, do that. <laughs> to first answer your question, um, I think what was on display for us prior to our coming on the, on the podium is hopefully something that we can agree on, is that God has gifted men and women with the same gifts. The question of, of the conversation is how should those gifts be used in order within the local church? But I, I hope that we can all agree uh, that, um, that, that Dr. Christina Emerson can preach circles around half the men in this room. Yeah, yeah I, you know, we, and, and we do, I think, uh, as Dr. Edmondson said, we're going to be saying this all day. Like Dr. Edmondson said. She really should be up here. Like, I, 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 can, I can cede my seat. Yeah. I, I, I think that um, the agreement is that we are, we are all conservative Christians. We're seeking to be faithful to the text. That's the agreement. And I think the agreement also is that uh, we're going to see uh, these texts differently. Right. And um, and we're going to have to say at some point, well, you know, we're going to disagree on how that how that's played out in the text. But I think also that um, while we're discovering these things and trying to work out um, how we understand, uh, one of the things Dr. Edmonds said, said is important that we we all come to the text with a bias. And 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 we come we come to the text with. We don't like to admit this, but with a, a particular end in mind, right? And, and that's true for egalitarians and complementarians, right? We have um, agendas. And with these agendas, we, we make the text say whatever it wants to say, or we, whatever we want it to say, right? And so, I mean, when we think about First Timothy and we think about Paul, is Paul right? Um, you know, I think that we have to go back a little bit and say, man, is, is Paul, what is he authoritative? Or if we could jump in and say, before we ask, is Paul right, is have we fully understood what Paul is saying before we ask if he's right? Well, I, I think, think it's a goes, premature question. Well, yeah, I think even further back, is Paul authoritative? Sure. I mean, so when, when we discover, um, you know, what Paul has said, is that going to be sufficient? <laughs> And, we'll, and what he says, is it going to be authoritative? Mm -hmm. 
because we can agree on, you know, what Paul has said and, and, and that yet, and then what happens, we just jettison him right. out of the conversation, right? right? Or we go some other place. So um, I think it goes back to, yeah, if we, we have to agree on the, the necessity, the authority, the clarity, and the sufficiency of the scripture. Right. So that's where we have to begin with this. And then we can get into some exegesis and expound and, and come to a, uh, what we believe the text is teaching. Yeah, yeah that's why I thought the question. I think the question I was thinking, if we hold to a position of inerrancy, a high view of scripture, that's one conversation. It's a different conversation if we don't all hold to inerrancy. And I'm fine having that conversation either way, but I think that has to be established whether or not Paul, through the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit, was writing God's breathed out word. And so if that's established, then our questions are hermeneutical and exegetical. And one of the hermeneutical principles I would throw out with all of our biases that God wrote us a book, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13 says this, Paul says, for we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand, and I hope you will understand until the end, that there's a perspicuity of scripture when sure. John writes of Jesus, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that's clear, he's the only way to God, mm -hmm. that God intends for us to read a text and actually to understand it, and if we have different understandings, then one of us is wrong, and we could show each other where we're wrong, and we could repent, but we have to have a conversation, exegetically, hermeneutically, who's wrong, and we need to have that conversation. That's what we're doing, having a conversation. Uh, but, but the first thing, where does that conversation need to go? And that starts off on our view of scripture. And I, I think we, at least for, for the panel here, I think we can agree and the inerrancy and the authority of the scriptures. I, I, don't, I don't know that we have to rehash that at, at this point. We do. We we do. Oh, inerrancy. I'm sorry. We do. We okay. We do agree. And the authority yeah. and the sufficiency. Certainly. Should we, should we like clarity. sign something? Please. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a confession. There's a... Just, just <laughs> let it be noted to all... Put your, <laughs> just put your fingerprint on there. <laughs> <laughs> we there. We got it. So, so from there then, can, can, we, can we go here? Um, one of the things that I think many Christians struggle with uh, in this conversation and so many conversations is do we completely go through the, the, all of the steps of inductive Bible study when we approach these texts? One of the things that I think many of us do is that we, there, there are, I'll say it this way, there are four steps in inductive Bible study. There's observation, interpretation, correlation, application. But what I feel is a lot of times we jump from observation to application without interpretation, allowing the cultural, biblical, hermeneutical context to, uh, to support the text that we're reading, correlation, finding the main truth, the timeless principle of the text, so that we can then get to application. And I think it's important that, as, as you were saying it's, it's so eloquently, is, okay, when we approach, for instance, 1 Timothy, after we do the observation part, and we read and say, see, that's what the text says, can we take the extra step of, can we, do, do we fully understand all of the contextual lenses that Paul writes this through? Do we fully understand what's going on in Ephesus and um, if seeing a woman teaching would, would uh, within that particular context, draw credibility away from the church? And would Paul, and here's another question just on an observation point for that particular text is, there's a couple of times in this passage that Paul seems to, and again, I, I approach this with more questions than I have answers, but I'm going to ask all my questions. And Bobby's going to have answers. It, it seems that Paul is speaking somewhat of personal preference in these passages. He says, I don't allow, I prefer. And, and, and do we skip that? In our, in, our, um, in, in our interpretation so that we get to our correlation and our application. And so these are the questions that come to the text for, for a person like Paul who would, who would do anything to make sure that we can reach anybody with, this is the same Paul who grabbed Timothy and said, you know what, I know you're Greek, but here's what we're going to do. Uh, we, we're going to Lystra and Derber, so, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to circumcise you. Now, this is the same Paul that said, beware of those who mutilate the flesh, and I wish they had cut the whole thing off. <laughs> but for this particular situation, it's what the Bible says, y'all. Come on. <laughs> but for this particular situation, 
He says, for the maximum impact of the gospel, let's do this. And I wonder if, if there's a similar situation happening in 1 Timothy, because again, in other passages, we see Paul making concessions, not concessions, but provision for women speaking in church in an orderly fashion. And so well, we, we got to well, wait. I think we got to wait all of it. Yeah. And I'm just a moderator, but so I don't want to... <laughs> But again, that's why at, at the very beginning or a few moments ago, I'm, I'm, pushing, I'm pushing the inspiration of Scripture. Sure. Because if, if, if Paul is, 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 if Paul is a, a, an author of Scripture, a divinely inspired author of Scripture, while we're going to get and try to, try to work on um, some of what appears to be Paul's preferences, uh, we can't take leave of the fact that he's still a divinely uh, inspired author of scripture. Sure. Now we want to, I, I, so that's why I ask at the very beginning because it, it, I think that very quickly the doctrine of inspiration can go out the window when we're doing, con, when we're doing contextual or, or cultural studies of the text. Well, let me ask you or this. The, or the author. Let me ask that's you this. because I'm I, just I, a moderator. I don't, right? but, but no, you sh <laughs> you're more than a moderator and you know that. Just because I, I want to be clear. <laughs> I want to be clear about what, what, what I'm not saying. Okay. Is it, so I'm, I'm going to return your question with okay. a question. Is it possible for us to say, for us to believe in the ins full inspiration of the scripture that when Paul is writing, he's writing, writing inspired scripture and to believe that there are certain things that he's writing because, because we, uh, we, we know that the Bible is not about us, that, that the original audience of this passage is not the, the 21st century American church. The original audience of this passage is a pastor in, the, in a city called Ephesus. Is it also possible that Paul is writing things to Timothy that specifically apply to the cultural context of Ephesus? And we can still, if we take the entire route of inductive Bible study, we say, okay, here's the observation, here's the interpretation based on its cultural context, here's the correlation, meaning there is a timeless truth that we can apply today, meaning we still hold to the authority and inerrancy of Scripture, and there are things that are specific to Ephesus that may not work in District Heights, Maryland. Yeah, let's... Um yeah, I, yeah I, would, I would agree with that, um, Bobby. There's two Bobbies up here, by the way. Yeah. Right? So I would agree with that, um, Bobby. What, it's the what, handsome Bobby and the talkative Bobby. <laughs> oh, Bobby. Let's, let's, let's move to some, some specific text. You brought up 1 Timothy 2.12. Because, no, we're not going to strip away um, Paul's personality in writing the scripture or the cultural context. We're not going to do that. I'm just, I want to be careful that when um, the text seems not to fit our cultural context, that we then lean on that one and kind of separate these as if the scripture is not organic and, and speaks to us today from that cultural context. Absolutely. Right? We have to do the hard work of getting it to where we are today. That's, that's all a part of our study of the scripture. But we don't want to just lean in and say, well, that's Ephesus. That's, that, that's not Waukegan, that's not Chicago, that's Ephesus. Absolutely. And it's a different date. That's what I'm careful of. As a moderator. And, 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 and I'm, and I'm with you 100%. Bobby, how about I, specific? I, I do not want us dismissing text saying, yeah. oh, that's just that context. But yeah. I do think we need to jump all the way in rather than, sure. rather than skipping over so I think important we're saying steps. Some of, the, some, of the, yeah. some of the same things. Okay, Bobby, yeah. you put, yeah. brought up 1 Timothy 2, uh, 12, right? Yeah, and I want, I want to give Judy plenty of time to talk okay. too. I, I, so the question is, um, does... Paul, does the scripture at time give temporal, limited uh, applications for an immediate context? And answer is absolutely, limited. absolutely yes. Limited. What's that? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just making sure. I didn't say limited. You said limited. No. So I just want to make sure no. that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can find all kinds of texts where there's a limited application to a specific individual, that individual only. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not meaning to uh, push back against that, what you said on that point, but, but, if, but if a text is doing that, then the text would tell me that. Now I want to say under the authority of the text because the text is the word of God. And so Paul tells us exactly why it is he's giving this, this sex or gender specific prohibition, and he doesn't tie it to uh, the immediate historical context of Ephesus. 
he goes back to God's created order. He says, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain in the position of a, and here's there's nothing derogatory about this. It kind of smacks us as if it might be, but this is just the position of a disciple that Paul, like Jesus, elevates women to the position of being his disciples. So we all sit at Jesus, be quietly under the authority of what he says. And so Paul, he recognizes that. But then he says, for it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. That's his reason. He could have said because their heresies in Ephesus, had that been the case, then the text would say something like, but I do not allow these specific women who are teaching heresies, but he doesn't specify a limited class of women. He just says, but I do not allow a woman, any woman, to teach or exercise authority over man. So there's nothing in this text that's limiting the application to a specific context in Ephesus only. So it is a general principle as he's stating it that he is applying according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, to the church, wherever it might be. So that's, def- I mean, that's definitely um, where a lot of people believe this is very straightforward. Um, and, and, you know, when you read the text, you certainly, you know, have to look at what it says. And yet, when you read verse 15, you suddenly say, well, we don't need to have a plain understanding of that. But women will be saved through childbearing, right? Okay, and so it, it's like, I thought they were saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, right? You know, so, so, but, so what, is, what is really being said here? If you're willing to apply it that way to this one, then you have to say, well, that's true too. But there's probably something going on beneath that. And, right, and so this is where, like, this is what I mean, like, why it's a, why we have to have this dialogue because some people will linger on one verse and then they don't look at the next and they don't realize that your hermeneutic is inconsistent. I mean, mine's mine's inconsistent sometimes, right? All of us. And we need to admit that. And so... Can I try to apply a consistent hermeneutic to verse 15? Well, sure. Let me me do it real quick, Bobby. So what I would say, I'm going to say this in 30 seconds. What I would say is that verse 15 said exactly what you did say. So I would say that verse 15, because I'm in the context of Genesis 1 through 3, that Paul here is citing in really clear language that's been echoing through the Bible, and you can hear it being echoed here, the proto-evangelium, that Paul is saying that the woman will be here, the idea of saved, is salva- salvation is not preserved, is not kept, is not protected. Whenever Paul used the word saved, it's spiritual salvation. So he's saying that one would be saved through the childbirth. There's a definite article there. So this is the childbirth of Jesus. And she is saved that she has faith in him, evidenced by her love. By trusting in the childbirth, she is saved. So, that's, so I'm, I'm in the context of Genesis 1 through 3. I haven't shifted my hermeneutic at all. Paul is referring back to the creation narrative on all of these verses. Yeah, so here's another point before I forget, because um, we're running out of time. But... If you, if you look at this passage and you want to, okay, so everybody has a guiding hermeneutic, right? Whereas um, egalitarians use Genesis 3, I mean, Galatians 3.28. Uh, complementarians use 1 Timothy 2. Um, but if you, and this is the benefit of reading the Bible from beginning to end, is that you know that if you read this passage, it doesn't make sense with what Paul is doing in his ministry. Because you see that if you go to Romans 16, he has this whole list of women that he works with, including Junia, who in verse 7 is an apostle. You know, and so you've got Priscilla, you've got Junia, you've got Trophina, Trophosa, Persis. These are all women that he works with, and they're co-laborers. And so, you know, I think this is why... It's a problem when people interpret Paul as a misogynist because I don't believe he is. He, he certainly co-labored with women and lifted them up and taught alongside them and dispatched them to different parts of the world. So I think that's why this passage in 1 Timothy, it's important to realize why he emphasizes Genesis 1 in the particular way he does. It's like Artemis is not the goddess Artemis is not God, she is not the Messiah. Or God is not a goddess, Artemis is not the Messiah. And so I I still think there's room for it to say, you know, this is very context specific because 
even Paul does not apply this all the way across in his ministry. And I also think there's room for clear, a clear line of authority, a clear line of spiritual covering, um, and a full and complete use of uh, uh, full complete uh, freedom for women to be able to utilize the gifts that God has given them within the context of the local church. And, and I believe Paul, again, he, he makes provision for that to take place um, in, the, in, in the Corinthian church as well as in other, other passages. And so um, I would, I, I, I don't want to harp too much on First Timothy, but again, I think we skipped over verse 14 um, in, 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 in that situation, is, in, which is another problem verse that kind of makes you cringe, and it doesn't, it doesn't fit cleanly um, when, 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 you know, when, when, we, when we look at verse 14 and say, yeah, you know, see, because it was, it was Eve that was deceived. And so, and so my question is, is not, did Paul say it? or was Paul right? The question is, is this the correlation? Is this the overarching spiritual truth, the, the timeless truth that we want to zoom forward into 2000, 2019 that women are more easily deceived than men and that's why they shouldn't teach? I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling, all I'm saying is, it, it's not as clean as we, as we think, as it, as it seems, and maybe, maybe there are more questions available to us as we examine this text and others um, when, when, when applying it to this particular conversation. Yeah. All right. um, let me try to keep verse 14. I don't know why you cringe. That, um, you know what verse 14 is saying uh, from the, 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 the narrative of the theological narrative of Genesis 3 is how we fell into sin that the serpent deceived Eve. And what you see in Genesis chapter three is a strategic strategy. He has schemes and he went to the woman to get the man to eat and he deceived her. And it's not a question of undoing what Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28 says that she's been made in the image and likeness of God. The problem in Genesis chapter three is that God had made an order. He made Adam first, commanded him to keep the garden to guard it, he gave him a spiritual prohibition so he had responsibility. Then he made Eve to help Adam. In Genesis 3, Satan went after that order and flipped it. So Eve now is leading, Adam submitting to her. Um, she's submitting to the animal, he's submitting to her. They're disobeying God. They flipped God's order. And I'm clear, it's true as, just like it's true today, it's true then, that apart from God or Christ, we can do nothing. She is completely helpless in the spiritual attack, changing God's order. God had an order for us to subdue and rule. She and Adam changed it. It simply doesn't work. It has nothing to do with her inferiority intellectually or her, her culpability. Any of us can be deceived by Satan if we go about doing God's work our own way. That's what you're saying, being condemned there. So, and I would go back and say that we all agree that God gave all the gifts to women just like men. And complementarian isn't saying that women can't use their gifts. Paul obviously is an example of that in Romans 16. I'm glad you cited that. that. But what you do see is there is a prohibition. In Ephesians 5, in the home, God wants the man to be the head. And also in the church, he has select few men to lead. Well, women help them in everything with all of their gifts. There's no limitation there other than being the pastor. So, so... <laughs> There's no time. I, I don't think all complementarians <laughs> you know, would what, amen what you just said, though. What you, what'd you say? We, all? Okay. What'd you say, what'd you say Bobby? Well, I, I've, I've heard, I'll say, I'll, I've heard sure. that there are, I've heard some complementarians that would not amen as loudly as, as my brother on the front row right there. As, is, who, uh, to, to what Bobby just said. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the complete freedom sure. for women to do any and all things in support. I, I, I've, yeah. I've, I I've think that, you been know in what, different conversations. It's amazing. You know what's amazing to me about these conversations is that uh, no matter where you land in the scripture um, it, 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 and no matter what book is being reviewed or whatever, it comes back to this central question. And that is who gets to preach in the church and who gets to lead the church? And then it's an amazing question and it's, a, it's an amazing, it's not a conundrum, I don't think. I think there are, I think the Bible's pretty clear on that, but that's the problem, isn't it? The problem, not, it's, not a, not, it's not a woman teaching. It's not a woman leading ministries in the church, right? Especially if you grew up in a black Baptist church because she did all of that, Amen. right? Um, the issue 
it comes, to, it comes down to who gets to lead the church and who gets to teach the church in or preach. Who gets to preach? And, and, that's, and that's the issue, right? Which is why I, I think that um, even in these conversations, whether we're egalitarian or whether we're complementarian, I think we need to be careful even in the language that we use, right? Because we might say, well, preach. Well, certainly she can preach. Certainly she can proclaim the word of God. But it carries something depending upon the context. If we're going to hook Paul into a context, we need to be aware of our context too. So when you said a moment ago, well, Sister uh, Dr. Evanson, she can out-preach any man in here. So uh, hair went up on people's heads and said, wait, 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 she's not a preacher though, is she? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is she? Is she not? <laughs> okay, see, but, she is. See, and, and etymology will get you there. But cultural context, which we want to hang on to Paul, will not get you there. It's going to cause problems. We need to be fair in the conversation, I think, okay, in so, the words that we use. So Bobby rolled right into Ephesians 5 and roped that Out of time. passage about marriage and headship into this conversation. And they use headship to equal lead leadership, which it's not. If you look at the biblical text, it doesn't read that way. There are three couplets. And submission is coupled with sacrifice not leadership. Okay, and then um, I wrote it down because I knew that this would be hard. So, and then the body or head is coupled with body, Source. not submission. Yeah. And then respect is coupled with love. But what happens is people couple submission with head and it creates all kinds of really unusual interpretations and applications. And so yeah. if we had like three more hours, we could totally like get into the text. If we had three more days, <laughs> yeah. right? Let me respond, come on, come on, I can let me respond in 30 seconds. Um, I, I think what Paul is doing there is consistent with First Peter chapter three, where you still have the language of a wife submitting to her husband. So I, 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 I just, we could look through like syntactically and diagram and just see what the, how the passage correlates, um, but I think the, the teaching in scripture is that from Genesis chapter two, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse seven and eight, that God made Adam first, and there was responsibilities there, and the one was gifted to help him, and I, and I think the New Testament follows that same pattern, whether it's Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3, that the woman will be in a helping submissive role, which is not derogatory at all, that it specifically says that it wasn't good for man to be alone. He needed help. It's not a help of convenience. It's a help of absolute necessity. And you see Paul act that principle out where women help in the making of disciples of the nations. So I think partly this divide and conquer strategy is Genesis 3 where Satan is whispering again. And I think we need to be careful that God has joined us together in a way where we complement and Satan wants to divide us so we aren't helping and we aren't leading and then we fall. Yeah. So I want to, can I just give like a real world example to kind of get away from the academic nature how, how, of the conversation? How long is your real world example? I haven't timed it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got 15 seconds. Okay. So I understand, that I believe, you know, when you read Ephesians about submission and head and body and all that, yes, I mean, you can't unread, you can't do the, all this gymnastics around it to get away from that. But this has affected my relationship with my husband, who's white, as we engage in racial reconciliation. And so wives submit to your husbands in all things. Does it mean I submit to his white supremacy when it shows up? Or how do I resist and yet respect him? And so when I'm talking, when you, when you really start to look at the real world implications of this and then you're fighting the racial reconciliation battle and say, oh, but wives, if you're married to a white husband, you need to submit to him in all things and don't like, you know, resist or anything like that. Then you start to go, oh wait, you know? Um, and so, but the way that it's affected, the way that our marriage is, it's like I know that I am limited in certain ways that I pursue j racial justice in the world. Um, and, and I need to respect where he is and where he's comfortable to a degree while continuing to be confident in who God has made me and how he's gifted me to speak. And you know, that's why you can't compare marriages anymore than you can compare people, right, and giftings. So it's like because I would love to, like there were times in, you know, I wanted to be like, I wish we were like those people doing these, this kind of work, but it's not. God has given us this work to do because of the particular architecture of who we are. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, anyway. Can I just 
is 30 seconds. So, you yeah, got three yeah, seconds. Yeah, Judy, thanks for saying. On, on. Yeah, yeah, Judy, thanks for saying that. That uh, a wife's submission is unto the Lord, and He is the authority. So that a woman, a Christian woman, should never do anything her husband tells her to do that caused her to sin against the Lord. Right. And she should never. And the church should never allow a woman to be in a submissive, quote unquote, relationship where she's being abused. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And then. If you even look in 1 Samuel 25, the example of Abigail and Nabal, yeah. just, just read it. You know, right. I mean. Right. That's right. Yeah. Since you're the moderator, I think we should turn back over to you because our time is up. Um, I believe we've had a full and helpful discussion and we won't be able to hit everything. Wait, so and so, Pastor Love, do you have any thank, closing thank, remarks? Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate that. I think we all just pray. Thank you. Um, Pastor Bobby, Pastor Manning, Sister Judy, thank you so much. Um, I, I think we have demonstrated that, for one, um, there is agreement on uh, the inspiration, the authority, sufficiency, and the clarity of the scripture. Um, that's a good starting point for this conversation. We want to get, egalitarians, complementarians, want to get at what the Bible teaches. And, and that agreement would carry us along. If we remember that, that agreement would carry us a long way in this discussion.